Philip Kant concludes our session. Uh, he works professionally with cryptocurrency and he talks to us about specifying blockchain protocols. Enjoy. Thank you very much. The microphone? Yeah, I think it really good. So I, I work at uh, IOHK um, and I'm leading the group for formal methods there. And I'm going to tell you something about one project that we do there, which is formally specifying a protocol for, for blockchains. And we're very happy to have experts from, from well-typed and from predictable, net, predictable network solutions on the team helping us there with their, with their expertise. Uh, a few words about IOHK. It's a company that's building blockchains and blockchain applications. And um, from the philosophy, it's a very research-oriented um, company, meaning that all the work that we do should be based on peer-reviewed academic papers where we collaborate with the authors and work closely with them together to, to basically to, to tell them, to, to get advice from them and give them advice on, on what works in practice and what does not. We're also invested heavily in functional programming, so the work that I'm, that I'm doing is in Haskell, and uh, we, we make that in order to get high quality software where we have, the sh where we have high assurance, because these, these cryptocurrencies that live on the blockchain, they, they carry large value, so um, we should do this right. And one, one project that, I'm, that, I'm, that, that this is all closely connected to, and which is the, the largest project that, that we have, is the Cardano Network, which is a blockchain platform. And it hosts the ADA cryptocurrency currently. And we're adding to that also smart contracts and various other things. <coughs> so let's uh, talk about um, blockchains and cryptocurrencies, which are um, basically money where you don't have a central authority that, that controls the flow of the money or the monetary policy or anything like that. And the most prominent example of this is Bitcoin. And those cryptocurrencies, they use blockchains in order to implement um, shared ledgers where everybody can basically enter their transactions that they do. And for these ledgers, for, for decentralized currencies, for cryptocurrencies, you, um, you need to fulfill um, some, some requirements that are, that are hard to fulfill all in once. One is that these cryptocurrency users, they are very adamant that they do not like that anybody have central control over, over their money. They want to have this not, not in the hands of one central, like, like a state or a central bank or anything. They want to, if, if they own the money, then they should be able to spend it to whomever they want, and nobody should be able to freeze their accounts or, or, or devalue their money or do, do anything like that, or, hear about, or pr print new money or block accounts or prevent some transactions from being entered. And uh, so that they don't want to have any, any central authority having control over the ledger, because if, if somebody controls the ledger, then they also control who can send money if they just refuse to get transactions from them. And um, of course, everybody who uses that, that uh, ledger must, must have some faith and, and some, um, some trust that, that the ledger is correct, because otherwise, if, if they don't have their trust, then the money is worthless, because um, yeah, and so if, if you don't have a central authority that, that does this, then uh, you, you need to have some other mechanism that creates trust, basically. And that is, that is what the blockchain does for cryptocurrencies. <coughs> and um, yeah, so, so basically they, you have protocols that, that create trust where everybody can, can join these. This is another requirement that, that nobody should be precluded from, from joining that network. And then uh, you somehow collaborate with everybody on the system to, to to take care of that ledger and enter those transactions. And uh, then you want, want to have the guarantees that if you have a transaction in the ledger, nobody can later on come and, and delete it. And if you send some transactions to that, then they, they should be included at some point. <coughs> and so, so these are the, the requirements, basically. Anybody should be able to join. There should be no central authority. And it should be working in the sense that transactions get there and they stay there. And um, maybe the most most famous example of this is uh, Bitcoin, and here's how this works. So individual users, they send transactions to the network, and um, they sign this with their private key so that nobody else can spend anybody else's money. And then um, these transactions get grouped into blocks, and somebody creates, that, creates a block with the transactions that they know about, 
and then somebody else comes and creates the next block for the transaction that they know about, and so forth. And now in order to get this really get from these from these uh, separate blocks from these pages in the ledger to get really one ledger, you have to connect them. And uh, you do that by including the, the hash of the previous block into the header of, of, your, of your block. And by that, you create an ordering along, along the blocks, and you have basically a linked list. And this, this ordering is important, because um, if somebody were to create, say, two transactions that, that spent the same money, that spent money from their account, but they, they overspent their account, then um, if, you, if you don't have an order, then you can't really decide which of those transactions should go through. But if you have an order, then you can say, OK, the one that was first there is the one that's valid. And uh, if, if they try to spend more money afterwards and they don't have it, then we reject that transaction as invalid. And um, then the idea is that um, everybody takes a turn to create a block from time to time. And by this, by, by this you basically you spread the trust. And uh, you don't have to rely on any particular party to accept your transactions, because as long as the whole world doesn't conspire against you, then your transactions will get through at some point. And um, of course, that, that's a bit of a problem, because if the system should also be open to anybody, and anybody can register there, then uh, there's nothing that prevents somebody from registering twice, or thrice, or 10,000 times. And if you just take turns, and you have somebody who's registering lots of times, then they can produce more blocks than anybody else. And they could just, they could just basically, they, they, could react transac they could reject transactions, or they could also try to to replace blocks that, that are already there. And um, the, the trick that Bitcoin uses is, is called proof of work. So um, what is that? The, the thing that you do is that you don't allow just, just any block to be valid. But um, you say that in addition to all these transactions, you allow people, the, the people who create a block to add some, some additional string into there. And the string will modify the hash of the block. And you then say that you require of all the valid blocks that the first n bits of the hash should be zero. And with that, it's, it's no longer easy to just take the transactions and, and group them and create a block. But you have to basically uh, try and try again with, with, this, with this arbitrary string that you can include <coughs> until you get by chance a hash that matches this condition. So you have to basically, you, you, you associate a cost with registering and that cost is CPU power. And um, then you, you um, have something that's, that's called the, the longest chain rule. And you say that um, if, if somebody would create alternative blocks, so um, in order to basically overwrite a transaction that they don't like. For example, they've spent their own money and got some goods for that, and they want to undo that transaction. Then in principle, what they could do is that they could um, try to fork off a, a fork from this chain from an earlier block that does not include that transaction and make the other parties accept that block as, as the valid truth. So they could, they could try to change the consensus and have their own transaction or some transaction that they want to have gone for, for some reason um, drop, be dropped from the ledger. But if there's a cost to creating new blocks um, and you basically say that all the honest nodes only accept the longest chains if they see multiple of them, then in order to, to undo some transactions, you would have to create many blocks, invest much CPU power, and um, unless you own more than half of the total CPU power in the system, then you can't really do that because the honest nodes will just continue growing the chain that, that's already there. And so with that, you have some guarantee. And, and that guarantee gets stronger the further you are down in the chain, that, that all transactions cannot be deleted. And that's, that's called proof of work. And um, in order to, to basically keep this, keep this hard and um, not, not fall basically to, to the improvement in, in CPU power that you have overall, this number n of bits that are required to be 0 is adaptive. So, um, if the rate at which blocks are produced gets up, then they get more difficult to produce. So, um, mm -hmm. uh, just wondering, um, you said that the, the good part, the uh, majority, mm -hmm. keeps uh, producing a longer chain. Yeah. So that the, the, the bad part can't keep up. Yeah. And does that depend on there being transactions, or does it grow the chain? Uh, no. Um, I mean. 
mean, you, you, you grow the chain basically all the time, um, and, and that's because you get a reward for creating blocks. So you, there, there's a, two kinds of rewards. One is that there's some level of inflation, so with every block there's new, new coins created, and the other is from transaction fees. And so basically everybody who takes part in that, they try to produce blocks as fast as possible because they, they, there's a permanent race going on. And, um, and that's because apart from the transactions that are in there, you have the hash of the last block. And so you, you try to solve this, basically solve for this hash. But as soon as there's one block that the other parties know about, that hash, that, that contents of the block uh, change, so you have to start a new. So if, if you take part in this, you want to create a block as fast as possible. And if there's no transactions in there, then so be it. Yeah. So um, because, because you still get the, the block rewards, then in other words, you work for nothing. And yeah, that, that works. That, that, um, it works, and it's it's uh, surprisingly simple. Sure. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question mm -hmm. uh, about uh, how this uh, works in principle? Mm -hmm. Like, um, if I have some Bitcoin, yeah, and I want to spend that, uh -huh. and that means I would need to create such a block. Uh, no, no. Um, so that's basically um, a separation. You would send a transaction towards some node that that is taking part in this creating blocks. Ah, okay. So. so yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, so the idea is that uh, the, these, are, these are called miners, the ones that create blocks that take part in these in these races. They accept transactions and they transact as many as they as they can fit in a block because they get some fees, and uh, they then do all these. That they basically take care of the ledger. Yeah, so um, the riddle that you have to solve is to uh, find basically a nonce that if you include it in the block, uh, will turn the first n bits to zero of the hash. And by varying the number of n, you can make this harder or easier. If you just require one bit to be zero, then it's basically a 50-50 chance. But it grows exponentially if you require more bits to be zero. And that goes up that that uh, basically reacts to the rate at which blocks are created. And so the more CPU power is in the total system, the faster blocks get created, the harder the, the system gets, the, the harder it gets. Yeah. And um, this basically, the, this, um, this leads to some kind of uh, an arms race because everybody wants these rewards when the price of Bitcoin goes up. So, um, and yeah, I mean, um, it's 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 a it's a surprisingly simple solution to this to this finding consensus consensus in a in a permissionless setting, but it, it has its problems. And one is that due to this adaptive uh, difficulty, you you need to basically you need to put lots of efforts into that because there's lots of people trying to do this because these rewards are so valuable at the moment, and um, and this leads to a huge energy consumption of the Bitcoin network, which is um, on the order of, of the the energy consumption of a small country. And um, it, it also doesn't scale very well. And um, yeah, right now you have a handful of transactions that you can do a second, and, and for that you have a huge energy consumption. And um, also, because uh, once you've lost the race for one block, you basically have to start anew because the, the, the riddle changes. So, unless you have uh, significant resources, it, it, there's no point in taking part in this mining. And that, that leads to more centralization because what people do is that they that they get together and create mining pools and basically uh, yeah they, they divert the work and but but they have they they are they have somebody um, that they group together and have groups that control a significant amount of the of the hashing power of the CPU power that is in the system and that's somehow contrary to the to the to the original idea I mean it, it works as, as long as the incentives for creating a block are moderately uh, yeah, are, are only moderate, then then you don't have this arms race that you have some. But but that's not how it works because these incentives get get larger and larger, so more people partake in it, and and really basically they they run these uh, mining pools not not in order to use the currency uh, as you said, but they do it for the rewards, <coughs> and you have a separation of users of the currency and the miners, and it's and it's no longer the for the user by the user, it's more for the user by the miners who might have very different incentives for for how they act. And um, so that's that's a problem that, that Bitcoin faces. And 
one way that you can see this, I mean, you can see this either as a race to solve a problem and then the winner gets, gets to produce a block, but you can also see this as some kind of randomized election where the, the, um, the, um, where basically every CPU gets one vote and the winner of the election, the chances of getting elected are proportional to the amount of CPU power that you invest. So it's basically, it's a, it's, a random, it's a random process of randomly electing the next leader to create a block. And so you can look for other resources that you can use to elect the next leader because you need something that's bounded because if, if, the, if it's something that, that you don't need to invest anything in, then there's no cost to, to register multiple times and you can just inflate your chances of being elected. It needs to be something, something that's, that's bounded. But just this, this useless uh, work of basically get, finding a right hash, that's, that's not, not ideal. So there's, there's multiple alternatives that, that have been suggested or tried out. One is called proof of useful work, where you say, OK, maybe we don't require people to calculate some hashes, but we let them do something like search for extraterrestrial intelligence or um, yeah, look, look for gravitational waves or what, what have you. Then there's also proof of storage, where you uh, basically give, give away disk space in order to get elected more often. But um, the thing that I'm going to talk about is called proof of stake. And there the idea is that um, the resource that you have to acquire in order to get election rights is the currency itself. Because that's something that is visible on the blockchain. And it's there anyway, because that's, that's the point of running the, the blockchain if you have a cryptocurrency. You want this currency and you have a finite number of tokens. And so what you just do every time you need to create a, a block, you randomly pick one of, the, uh, one of those tokens, one of those coins, and say that the owner of this coin, meaning the one who has the cryptographic key that, that can sign transactions for them, that the owner of this coin is eligible to produce a new block. And that's, um, that basically removes this, this, this huge cost of, of energy that you have to put into the system. And it's, it's, a, it's a quite nice idea because also the, the people who own a lot of this currency, they are incentivized to keep the system in, uh, not compromised. Because if you, for example, if you were to try to revert your own transactions and you are a large stakeholder, you own lots of money in the system, then you could do that. But uh, if that were to become public, then the value of the currency would decrease rapidly because the system would, would be um, corrupted and so you would devalue your own currency. And the more stake you have in the system, the less you are incentivized to basically um, bring the whole system down, which is what, what would happen if you, if you were to attack it. And um, so the, the, the small term gain of basically getting your money back from one transaction by, by replacing one block would be outweighed by, by the long term gain of the price decreasing because people lose trust in it. Uh, one thing that for a long time um, prevented these, this proof of stake from, from working is that the source of randomness that you have in the election when you're using proof of work is implicit. It's just you have this, this race that's going on in the real world. And so it's, it's like, a, yeah, it's, it's, it's like a, a random process, but you don't have a random number generator in the system. For proof of stake, you need to randomly pick a coin explicitly in the protocol. So you need to have some random number generator, and everybody in the system must agree on that. But if you agree a priori to one, one seed, say, then people could try to, to shift their, their, um, their coins and, and do transactions in order to basically predict, they could predict which coin gets elected, and then they could manipulate their own accounting in order to increase their chances to get elected. And um, that's something that you don't want to do. So you need some source of randomness that everybody agrees on, but that is not known before the next uh, slot leader is elected, or be before the election takes place, or, uh, or before, before the stake is, is known for, for the election. And so there, there's multiple ideas to do that. The, the simplest idea basically is, okay, we have all these hashes anyway in the blockchain, so what if we just hash the last block, or we hash the last n blocks, or something like that. But then the problem is that the one who creates the block can do stuff like permuting the transactions or, um, or, or dropping transactions or putting transactions there on his own and manipulate the hash of the overall block. And because um, he basically, and then you can test whether the, that hash that, that results in gets me elected in the next slot as well. So you could basically try to get 
you could use your hashing power that you use in these proof of work systems again in a proof of stake system in order to get permanently elected by just manipulating the source of randomness. <laughs> and so um, the, these are things that basically um, kept proof of stake protocols back for some time. But um, we now have a, a protocol that basically um, over, overcomes these problems and is provably secure. And um, it's called Uroboros. That's from the Greek mythology. It's a, it's a snake that bites itself in its own tail. And the, the idea is that you split uh, time into slots and you group those slots into epics. And then for each slot, you have somebody who is eligible to create the block. And for one epoch, you have a fixed uh, random number generator that is fixed after the stake is known. So you assume that, that the stake does not change too much over an epoch. And then once you go to the next epoch, you have to get a new seed somehow. And the way that you do that is that uh, the stakeholders are responsible for agreeing on some seed, but they do it in a way that, that nobody can predict the result before, before, it's basic, before, it's, before, it's, before the stake is, is fixed. So what, what you do is that everybody uh, tosses a coin, and then um, afterwards they get all these coin tosses together. But in a way where before beforehand you make basic you you um you make a you you post something to the chain with which people can after the fact verify that the point that you reveal only in the end is actually the one that you, that you um, that you um, tossed in the first place. So it's 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 a it's it's an it's a separate protocol for for some um, shared um, shared coin tossing. And the, the point is that no single stakeholder has control over, over the randomness, but it's, it's something that the stakeholders agree on. And that's, that's one large part that, that makes this protocol work. And the paper contains a proof of the security against adversaries in a, in a certain adversarial model. And at the heart of this proof is um, the concept of uh, forkable strings. So what they do is that they look at the sequence of slots and they say we have slots where there's an honest party, where he's a zero, and you have slots where an adversary is elected. And then they can do things that don't adhere to the protocol, like publishing two blocks, or creating a block but not showing it to everybody, or something like that. And um, then they, they basically analyze what properties such a string of ones and zeros has to have in order for the adversary to um, create a situation where they can later on pick one of two chains. And then they could basically say, okay, in this one chain I have, I have my transactions, and then later on I can, I can force the system to switch another one. And for this you need quite a lot of uh, uh, slots where the, where the adversary is elected. And um, so basically they, they then um, uh, look at the probability of, of drawing such a, what's called forkable string. And uh, based on these probabilities, they can give guarantees um, based on the amount of stake that the adversary has. So this is um, basically 10% of the stake up to 45% of the stake. And then they can say, OK, if I want to have 99% security that my transaction cannot get reverted by an adversary of this power, how long do I have to wait in minutes? And then um, they can either say a general adversary can if, if they have 10% of the stake, it's, it's safe after five minutes. Or if they have nearly half the stake, I might wait 600 minutes. And um, they, can also, they also do an analysis for a restricted adversary that tries to stay covered. So they don't pub make things that are obviously against the protocol, like publishing two blocks for one slot. And then um, you can compare this to, to Bitcoin, where the waiting times are much longer, and where this, where this adversary um, basically has to own 10% of the, of the hashing power, or 30% of the hashing power. So, um, and this, this, this protocol is what's running at the moment as, as the backend of Cardano. We have a, an implementation in Haskell, and that's, that's what's running at the moment. <coughs> um, however, there's, so, yeah? Uh, what about liveness if you, if you elect a leader, mm -hmm. does it doesn't do anything? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so, uh, you, you could have, uh, leaders that, that are able to, to do something, but they don't do anything. But that, that's um, not something that, that then they are not playing according to the protocol. They, they could be offline. Okay. And uh, uh, offline stake is a problem. If you have too much stake offline, 
then that plays into the hands of the adversary, basically. So within the um, security analysis, the stake that's offline is counted towards the adversary, basically, because, because it's a slot where, where the honest uh, stakeholders don't do anything. So it's not here into protocols, so it's counted as, as this area. Do you have relations of when people are offline? Um, so uh, no, that, that we don't have that. What, what we do is that basically at the start of an ad hoc, the leaders get elected. And then, in principle, you would know when, when it's your, turn, your time to show up. And, uh, the, but the, the, the bigger part that we do for preventing too much offline stake in the system is that we say, okay, for, for small stakeholders who maybe own a few thousand aid or something like that, they don't want to run their own node. So what they can do is that they delegate their stake to somebody whom they trust to, to act on their behalf. And they will get some, uh, some rewards and they will share it with the people who delegate it to them. And we'll make sure that there's uh, incentives, basically, for making sure that your stake is delegated, that there's not too much delegation on one single party, because that would lead to centralization again. So it's a, a bit like, the, like these mining pools, where people collaborate in order to increase their chances. And it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a, an, an efficiency thing that you have, that you don't have too many nodes, and that you basically don't, don't have to expect small stakeholders to be online all the time, which is not reasonable. Another question? Or? You basically answered I answered it. Uh, okay. But yeah, uh, how do you prevent this, the centralization? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, the, the thing is that uh, we have some, some freedom in defining how the rewards for producing a block are, are made. And so we have basically, we, we have game theorists looking at how, do we, how should we uh, make the incentives uh, in terms of, of how much stake some, some, sta some block producer has in order to basically get to a situation where the equilibrium would be lots of medium-sized stakeholders. And, and yeah, the thing is that if you, if you have too much stake, then your rewards go down at some point. Your rewards per block would go down. <coughs> right, yeah. The next improvement of this uh, protocol is called Roboros <laughs> Players. And uh, the thing is, we, we um, basically, we um, discretize time into these intervals where you create um, where you create blocks. And in the security analysis of Roboros, it's assumed that messages get across the network within one time slot, within one slot. And the thing is, sometimes that, that might not happen. And um, so the Roboros Prayers is an extension of the protocol which works in a semi synchronous setting. And um, the, basically, the security analysis assumes that the adversary can delay messages from time to time. And uh, they can delay it for, for, some, for some parameter. And then the, the higher you get with this parameter, the longer they can delay messages, the, the weaker your security guarantees get. But it's not like it, the whole analysis just becomes invalid. If is, you there, have is there to. any meaning behind these um, names, like Ouroboros, Prowess, is it Latin or Roboros? Uh, it's, it's Greek. It's Greek. So Ouroboros is, is the snake that bites its own tail. And that's because uh, during one epoch, you create the randomness for the next, and, and so forth. And the prowess is, I think it's something like calm or something, or, uh, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I, I'm not, I think it means calm, but I'm not sure. Calm. I'm not I'm not firm in Greek, so. Calm. Okay, good. Um, and this protocol is what we're currently uh, implementing for, for future versions of Cardano. And um, now if, if you, and, the thing is, when, when we're now re-implementing um, the, the system and trying to make it even harder and, and get, get to improve our guarantees of, of, um, of security in the presence of message delay, then we can also take a step back and look at the process of how we, do the pro of how we go from, from a research paper to an implementation code, because there, there's quite a bridge to get there. Um, and the, the, the paper, the, the scientific publication, it's written in plain English, and it's at a very high level of abstraction. And the code, on the other hand, deals with all the details of the real world, and it's written in Haskell, so there's no ambiguity, it's a very uh, low level thing. And the paper needs to be at this high level of abstraction because that's how you can think and reason about these protocols, otherwise you get, get messed up with these, all the details if you think about network stacks and all that kind of stuff. So um, you have to somehow bridge this gap between, between a publication written in English and, and math formula and code that is in a much more formal language 
and is at a much higher level of detail. And then also you have to think about how can you preserve these proofs that you have in the paper all the way down to the code. And um, the thing that we want to do is that we do this not with one big leap, but with many small steps. Where the initial step is to take the paper and translate the algorithm to a very formal language, which is basically li like a like programming language. And at that point, you have an acceptable specification, but you are still at the same high level of abstraction. So it's a one-to-one it's -one, um, translation, basically. And you can, if, if, you, if you teach the researchers the language that you use for this formalization, then they can say, yes, this is what I meant. And so there, there's no detail added. It's just a translation, one-to-one -one translation. And then you can make many small steps where you refine this, this initial specification. And these steps should be small enough that, that you are certain that they, that they are correct, either by proving them or by just looking at them. That's it. And, um, and you, you explicitly, when you add detail, you make design decisions. And you want to be explicit about this. You don't want to do this in one <coughs> large step. And during every step that you do at the refinement, you want to be able to simulate how the protocol behaves, and you want to be able to test that, that stuff is still correct. Um, now, th the question is, of course, what kind of language do we, do we use for that? And the answer is that we are dealing with um, distributed systems here, and there's already a wealth of literature there, which is uh, process calculi, which are basically languages where you describe um, distributed systems in terms of processes, and these processes communicate via channels. And then you can, uh, you can compose these processes, either in parallel or sequential. They can send and receive data via these channels. There's no shared state. It's everything implicit via channels. And um, in, in these theories of process calculi, you have very precise meanings for stuff like processes are the same up to, up to refinement, where you say, OK, you have something like observational equivalence or bisimilarity, where you say that two, two processes basically are interchangeable if, if one of the processes can take an action, then the other one can take that action as well. And the resulting processes, again, can take the same actions. And this is very well formulated, and you have a nice theory about that. And it's, it's compositional. So if you, if you have <coughs> interchangeable processes, then you can, you can do stuff like equational reasoning. You can replace one process by the other. And um, there's lots of theory and also tools for this. And there's, yeah, there, there's a wealth of literature and, and tools and theory. And so we chose to use this. And in particular, we chose to use the uh, Psi calculus, which is a, a parametric family of process calculi, actually. It's an extension of the, the Pi calculus. And what you do is that you specify uh, types for the terms that you have in your language, and the conditions and assertions. And then you get, you get a, basically one process calculus. And within this process calculus, you have stuff like a finished process. You have a process that can do some output n on a channel m. You have a process that can take input from a channel and you have um, case conditions and, and parallel application, replication where you do some, some process ad infinitum. And um, this, this Pi calculus is uh, well advanced. You have lots of theory tooling and Psi calcular workbenches and there's a formulation Isabel where you, that helps you to prove, um, to prove um, stuff about these processes in Psi calculus. The way we uh, formulate the um, Psi calculus is as an embedded domain-specific language within Haskell, which basically fixes the question of what data terms we allow and what, what conditions and, and so, so forth, because that's all just inherited from the, from the uh, host language. And then we write Ouroboros Preos in this language. And that's a very good starting point for simulations. It's for, we can also then uh, write an interpreter for that language that exports to a proof assistant like Isabel or Hock. And we can also then, once we have this initial specification, we can refine it and add details like networking and, and all like that, and then go down all the way to production code within, within Haskell. And um, that's, that's very nice. And so uh, let's have a brief look at how this looks like in practice. So when you, when you define a, a domain-specific language in Haskell, you usually define um, a data type, and this, this data type is high here basically contain, contains the, the finished process. It contains a constructor for basically creating a channel that can consume some input for creating a new channel, for creating some process that, that takes some input, 
or for a process that sends some input, and then also for logging, so that we can do um, that we can do losses as output from simulations, for instance, for example. And then once you formulate your process as a number of these processes, your 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 uh, your your protocol in terms of a number of these processes, you can write uh, a number of interpreters for this language. For example, you could do one that does a simulation, and then you would get as an output some, some log messages. You could export it to, to a proof uh, system, or you can actually run it, then export it to I.O. And uh, it, in practice, when we, when we use this, it, it looks a bit more complicated, because we also add um, broadcast channels, but that's basically the way that it works. And there's, there's additional detail, like allowing broadcast processes, allowing um, forks, and, and stuff like that. <coughs> Yeah, the, 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 the channel, so basically you, you would um, implement the channel for an export reusable as just picking picking new names. And okay, so you don't actually get to inspect any of these eight things. You have to like, but it's one of the higher order things. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, okay, another thing that, that's critical to, to these blockchain protocols is uh, performance, actually, because um, on the one hand, the users want to, long, want to know how long does it take for my transaction to be included in the system, and how long does it take if I, if I join the network until I have downloaded the blockchain and stuff like that, and how long until I, until I know stuff about my funds. But also, and perhaps more importantly, um, can we propagate a block through the whole network before the next slot starts? Because we have this slot time, which is 20 seconds in Ouroboros, or in, in Cardano, and so we want to make sure that the blocks can actually propagate through the system, because otherwise you get, get forks, and, uh, which, which looks like adversarial behavior. It, which is a bit more mild in the browse protocol, because there can be message delay, but we want to, we want to predict how long the message delay will be. And yeah, we also want to reason about the resource requirements that we'll need for running a node. And um, the framework that we have there, which was um, developed by the people at Bridge Server Network Solutions is called Delta Q, which is basically modeling, modeling performance as the absence of anything that impairs your quality. And so if you, if you wait for, some, for something to happen, then it will have some distribution over time <coughs> happening, some probability distribution. And if failure is a possibility, then this probability will, of, of it happening will never reach one. And also late arrival is basically not distinguishable from from not arriving at all, because at some point you have to you have to decide whether the stuff is there or not. Um, so this this delta Q is basically it's an improper CDF, and um, we want to include this in our simulations and in our, our models. So um, how do we uh, how do we talk about this in Haskell? Well, it's again just just a data type that <coughs> takes some random source, some random number generator, and then produces maybe the number of seconds after which it happens if it didn't fail and also advanced to the standard generator. And then there's something like, like fundamental uh, distributions, like the drug delta, which just happens after a number of seconds every time. If you have stuff that, if you have miracle and never, which happen instantaneously or never, you can also have uniform distributions, and you combine, they can combine them nicely. Like if you, if you have two separate instances that happen one after the other, then you wait for the first, then you wait for the other. If one of them fails, the whole thing fails, it's a monoidal structure. And you can also basically um, have external choice where you have a random choice between two different distributions. Uh, one example for this would be you have a ring where you, where you send messages from one hop to the other. And each of these message hops has a certain delay and a certain chance of failure. So one, one delta Q. And then you want to send a message all across the ring. And uh, what you can do is either you just do this once and ignore failure, and if, if one of the, any one of these hops fails, then the whole thing fails. And then, of course, if there's some chance, that this will exponentiate. Uh, or you could retry if it doesn't reach the end, or you could retry if it doesn't reach the next hop. And you, you can simulate this with this Delta Q framework. This is basically uh, the chance, if you, if you don't do any retries, then either it goes through on the first step or it doesn't. If you do retries after, after it doesn't reach the initial node, then basically you have the chance of it happening the first time, or the second, or the third, and you, you basically get towards a higher probability of, of, um, of success, but with a long delay. 
all you do, all you retry every time, and then you basically have this nice curve here. And uh, this delta Q formalism that allows us to simulate the, um, the performance, we can include this in the Psi calculus by just saying we to, to the input we add a timeout, and then the, the input of the process should be not an A, but a maybe A, because it could have failed. And we also associate a delta Q with the with with sending. And then when we want to reason about performance, we use these annotations. And if we export to proof resistance and are only interested in the functional correctness, then we just ignore them and are back to the original side calculus. Of course, we can go one step further, which is a reasoning about how these delta Qs compose. If we have, for instance, two processes and we want to wait for the first one to finish, then we just take the minimum of these two. If we want both of them to finish, then we have to wait until the maximum. And if we have something like sequential composition, then uh, the, the mathematical structure is a convolution. So you wait until, basically, you add here the, the both of them become non-zero, then it starts to be non-zero. And that's what, what sequential composition looks like. And um, then you can uh, go away from only simulating to also writing Basically, basically writing another DSL for this delta Q in Haskell, where you have delta Q terms that could be an exact delay, it could be a variable, it could be composition of two delta Qs, it could be waiting for the first of the number of process to finishes, for the last of them, choice, or um, dependent first to finish, where you basically do different actions depending on which one of these processes finishes first. And then you can uh, either go, go again to simulations, or you can write algebraic expressions for them. And, and there's algebraic rules that, that basically correspond to how these, these things add up. And you can simplify those. And then at the end, if you assign delta Qs to all your atomic operations, you can get a delta Q expressions for the overall final system. And that is very valuable because you, you basically see the impact of, of some terms there. And you know where you have to optimize. And you know where the critical paths in your system are. And then, uh, if, if you do this from the start, and you do it with every refinement step, you basically see whenever you introduce a bottleneck in the system before you have the system at a point where you can actually run it. And that's very valuable in, in uh, designing these things. Right. Um, with that, I'll, I'll like to conclude, and I have zero minutes left. Um, the, these cryptocurrencies, they carry large value, and so it's important to basically to, to make sure that they are that they are implemented correctly. That the underlying, that they, that they are grounded on solid bedrock. And in particular, because they're also proposed for other critical infrastructure like land deeds. And so you need something that's really fit for purpose where you can, if companies want to use that, they want to be able to get assurances for that. So you need to be able to, to demonstrate that you did this all correctly. And, and one thing is basing this all on peer reviewed uh, academic literature. And the other thing is that you will go towards high assurance software where you, base, where you make sure that all the steps that you have to do from the translation from the paper to the refinement and adding details, everything just um, that doesn't spoil the, the, um, the proofs that, that the um, cryptographers have put so much effort in. And um, yeah, with that, you can also keep an eye on performance when you, when you do it like that. And let me just remark at the last point that uh, all of this is in an open GitHub repository. So if you want to look any further, I couldn't go into all too much detail here, but if you want to look at how these protocols actually look like, then uh, that's where you can, where you can look at that. Thanks. Time for one short question. Two? OK. <laughs> So uh, what we did in practice is that we did an uh, ICO, so an initial coin offering, where people could buy something from the initial stake for, uh, for, for real currency. And then that's what the initial stake distribution is. And uh, yeah, then it goes from there. That's that's uh, that's something that we are, uh, yeah, that, that we're seriously considering because it could happen that people lose their keys or they die or anything, and uh, and then uh, stake becomes offline. If too much stake is offline, then then it just um, it plays into the hands of the adversary, and the blockchain doesn't progress anymore. So um, 
we are thinking of basically inactivating stake that is de detected to be dead, so that that doesn't take part in the in the protocol at all until it shows up again. If I mean, if it, if it, uh, if it you you can see that when it, when it changes, basically when when the when the money is moved, then it then you would know that somebody is actually uh, holding it, so you could you could make it active again. There's also um, thoughts about uh, you, you could automatically delegate stake that is offline too long to some party that is generally trusted, but then of course you add a trusted party which um, is somehow against the spirit again. Great, thank you.